turned everything that's been turned into me except your special projects, and I haven't finished reading those. So everything, hopefully, is in the uh, student lab, 123 lab. And uh, I have a list here of one things that might be missing. And th this was up to yesterday afternoon. Some people have turned in things since then, and that won't be on here. So pass this around and note what is missing, different reports that are missing. Follow me? That I don't have them. But don't panic if you think that you've given it to me. Um, I may have just missed it, or you may have forgotten to turn it in. And then I also have a list of uh, the optional extra work that some of you have turned in. And just to make sure, this is a list of people who have turned it in. If you have done some extra work and it's not on that list, you better let me know about it. All of this is negotiable. Um, I really enjoyed, you can't believe this, I really enjoyed reading the reports. One thing nice about not being too explicit, you get really a, quite a creative um, approach to a lot of these things. And even the library, the literary reports, which were mostly of things I've read before, were really fun to read again because you forget some of the details and to see other people's points of view. One thing in all of this, whether it's a report of the lab work or report of the literature, I think you fell into two camps. Either those that were terribly, terribly critical or those I thought were kind of laissez-faire and a little lackadaisical in being critical. Of course, it's a very subjective thing. All I'm saying is that none of you were exact, saw things exactly the way I did. <laughs> you either saw them more critically than I did or less critically. But nevertheless, if I made a, a point, made a note of that on one of the reports, it might be worth your while for you to think about that, a little introspection to think maybe you are being a little too critical or not being critical enough. Uh, I liked the way things were being spelled. There were some new spellings. Uh, I think I might have misspelled this wrong sometime because a lot of people had it misspelled wrong. This is correct. Inoculation is with one N. Houses with two S's. Control is with two L's. The reason I put that out in there is because I just made a handout and I spelled it wrong. <laughs> right at the top there with one L twice. I'll come to that in a minute. Um, we're going to clean the lab up tomorrow. By we, I don't mean us. That would be nice, but uh, Mrs. Sanicky. If there's any materials that you want to save or you're still involved in the experiment, uh, let me know or remove them because we'll be throwing out most of that stuff. Some, can I ask a question now? Some of you, I thought at one time that you were getting some uh, lactobacillus trichoides on a plate from wine number five and wine number six. If any, do any of you still think that that's what you had? If you had, I'd like to ha I would like the plates. Okay, uh, we, I want to see you later anyhow, Mitchell. Aren't we about to tip up those wines, and so we can pick up the plates then, okay? Oh. Well, I'll talk to you after this. Okay, on the, the uh, fusel oil handouts, I kind of feel like the last third Tuesday, like the bear trapper that set the bear trap and fell into it himself. Um, I think that it was a little, not too smoothly given. I think the highlights are presented better on this handout that I've already passed out on both sides to try to um, show you the pathways and try to talk some, somewhat about the metabolic control mechanisms, which are not well understood, uh, yeah, uh, or in some cases are not well worked out, but to give you some of the latest thinking on that. And I don't want to go into detail now on it. I think we did enough on it already. So probably spent too much time. Where I have the stars uh, on the indicated, that may be where I misspoke uh, on Thursday. So Tuesday. So look, five-pointed five star. Yeah, like you see them? No, no. I mean the big one, like that. Oh, expert at that. Um, so look, look over those parts carefully. The one part where I really fell into a trap was the thing that, and it's worth repeating, but this is the only thing that's worth repeating, is that. We keep saying that uh, we know that it shouldn't be, there shouldn't be any mitochondrial or any Krebs cycle uh, processes in yeast uh, with high glucose, in, even in the presence of air, because, it should be, because everybody says that the Crabtree effect inhibits this. But in fact, this is the trap. The fa in fact, we do get some effect of air, and we don't, don't really know what the story is on this in, in cases of wine making, in the cases of wine yeast. Okay, let me drop that, all right? 
Now I want to finally go on to talk about the microbes on grapes. This was the thing I mentioned at the very beginning, uh, when, was it, when was that, uh, 10 weeks ago, that we should talk about first. Naturally, we got the grapes. We should talk about the, the microbes on the grapes first. But we had other things to talk about at that time, and so we've let it go, and now is a good time to talk about it. But I think you might think, well, we've already talked about this, haven't we? Uh, we talked about spontaneous fermentations, uh, different, successions, different successions of yeasts. Well, no, that's not what we're talking about. That, in that case, we were taking grape juice, say with no inoculum, and looking at what the first yeasts are there, the greatest amount, say Cleckera, and then what follows that, maybe Hansenula, and then finally species of Saccharomyces. But that's not what we're talking about now. I'm going to talk about the, on the grape itself, on the mature grape, before it's crushed, before you get fermentation, what have people actually found? And that hasn't been so well studied, but there is an interesting new paper out from Bordeaux where they took grapes aseptically from, or sterilely, I should say, well, no, aseptically, that's the right word, isn't it, from the vines and looked at them. Now, this is kind of the thing that Pasteur did, this great man again, who tr was trying to, uh, that sounded sarcastic, I didn't mean that, this great man who was trying to prove that there, without life, there is no life. I don't know if you know this story, where he put bags over the grapes as they were flowering, so he would end up with berries that were sterile, sterile, not just aseptic, but sterile, no, no yeast on them at all, no drosophila had gotten in contact with these berries, and then crushed them and didn't get any, and kept them sterile, didn't get any fermentation. But if he let them open to the air, then he got fermentation. Well, this is not a very easy kind of experiment to do, and I wonder how many successes and how many failures he got, but at least, um, he proved something. And this is the kind of experiment that people in Bordeaux were doing, uh, only that they waited until the, gra the grapes were mature, and then they picked these grapes aseptically and s squeezed them, made a solution of the washing solution, as it were, of the grape juice itself, and then diluted it sterilely and, or aseptically, and then plated these to see what kind of grapes they got. Well, they didn't check anything that they wouldn't find more than, everything was more than 500 uh, yeast per berry. In other words, let's see, um, they didn't detect yeast that were less than 500 yeast per berry. In other words, if there were Saccharomyces there and there was less than an amount of less than 500 yeasts, individual yeasts per berry, they wouldn't detect it. And in fact, they didn't find any Saccharomyces. So if Saccharomyces was there, it was less than How's that? If Saccharomyces is present, it would be less than 500 yeast per berry. But what do you suppose they did find? Well, yeah, Cleckera was the one they found in the largest amount. Cleckera, Cleckera uh, piculata. They didn't check to see if it was sporulating form or not. So it's possibly that would be Hansi Hansinia spora, but they assumed that it was not because everybody else has found Cleckera. Two others that they did find, it might surprise you, Mechnicovia, I should have written that on the board first, too. Yeah, Pulcheremia, found that. And it's surprising, this is the first time I think it's been reported on grapes, they found Rotatorula. Not very many of them, but this is people in Bordeaux. I, oh, I have the authors here. It was in Archives for Microbiology. Barnett is the major author, Barnett et al. Our, well, actually, it's changed its names now to Mark Archives for Microbiology, but it used to be Archives for Microbiology. It's a German journal. Uh, 1972. Well, I said it was brand new. Volume 52. And then they also found Cleckera. The amount they found is kind of interesting. They found about 10, total of 10 to the, 10 to the fifth yeasts for berry, which they calculated knowing the average surface area of the berry to be about five times 10 to the fourth yeasts per square millimeter. How's my writing? Can you get that? Yeast per berry and five times 10 to the fourth yeast per millimeter square millimeter. Well, I did a little calculation figuring that, let's say a yeast is square of about five microns. 
And the, if you've figured, figured out in how many yeast you would get in a uh, square millimeter of yeast of this size, if they were packed just like that, you would get 4 times 10 to the 4th. So it, what it means is, with these assumptions, hmm? it means, no. <laughs> there's less. The number is less. It's 5 and it's 4. But it means that there's, it's pretty well, pretty full of yeast. Now, there is some electron scan micrographs of, of grapes, which I haven't seen. And people have, and it's been published, but I haven't seen them yet. They, in, their, in that paper, they said that most of the yeast were found around where this, uh, what's that called? The pinnacle? Pedestal, yeah. Uh, around in here and not down here, but I, I haven't seen it. That would say, that would not be consistent with this, but I've made a lot of assumptions, and Klecker is pretty small yeast also, so maybe that's the uh, point. By the way, none of these are really fermenting yeasts, like Saccharomyces yeast. They don't um, carry out to, to dryness, so that's kind of interesting. What else did they find? They found penicillium, and they found some, uh, where's Mr. Steele? He'd be happy to know. They found some gram-negative rods. They checked to see if they're gram-negative or not. <laughs> a lot of good that tells us. Uh, that's all they found. Um, are you surprised if they didn't find any lactic acid bacteria, or did you know that? It's so interesting that Radler tried to find lactic acid bacteria, malolactic or lactic acid bacteria on grapes, never found them, found it in le on some leaves, and maybe some Maybe we have to think in terms of other things besides the grapes themselves when we're talking about spontaneous fermentation. Maybe we are getting some leaves in uh, the um, fermentation. Well, we are getting some. Maybe that's where some organisms are coming from. Yeah. Yeah. Now, um, I think you were a minute late. <laughs> but, uh, the point, I, this is different from what you talk about a spontaneous fermentation. In spontaneous fermentation, that's true, you get a succession, you can actually measure these different ones, and you end up with Saccharomyces. But we're talking now about the mature berry itself, and it means that any Hansenula that's there is a very small amount compared to these others. And this is an, this is an area of Bordeaux where you would expect that succession, Klecker, Hansenula, the two Saccharomyces. You aren't getting any, that doesn't mean the Saccharomyces aren't there. They're a very small amount, and they grow fast, they're alcohol tolerant, so they take over anyway regardless. So that's what we find on the mature berries. But we also want to talk about um, other kind of uh, uh, molds that are found on berries. And let's talk about infected grapes, grapes that are moldy, that are, that are not healthy, not sound grapes any longer, that something's gone wrong with them. Now, one thing I have left out, we haven't talked about diseases of the vine itself before maturity of the grapes, and that's, I think, a little bit beyond, as I say, beyond the scope of the course. That's really a pathology uh, course. But we can talk about the mature berry and the grapes that are on it. We can talk what happens to the grape juice itself, and then we can talk about organisms found on the, on the grapes, especially damaged grapes. And we're going to go through this list, but uh, let me preface it first. It seems that there has to be some damage to the grapes first before you get an infection. That sound berries are not generally infected so much that they break open and cause, uh, cause damage. They might have some organisms on the outside. We found this out really striking. Uh, Mr. S uh, Traverso, I just saw him looking in the corner. I guess he left. Uh, knew I was going to talk about him, maybe. That to, to do, we were doing some experiments trying to infect grapes. And with uh, Professor Nelson's uh, expertise, we learned we had to do something to the grapes to get an infection. We had to treat them roughly, either with hot alcohol or else punch a hole in the grape itself before you could get an infection. Now, uh, and there isn't a lot of um, information on what really happens in a vineyard when a bad infection comes in, especially in California, I should say. There is one study that's been done in the North Coast, and there they found that Generally, botrytis was the first one that came in. Maybe there's some damage had to happen first, but the first organism that took over usually was botrytis. Then if things got bad enough, then you could have a secondary infection with other uh, organisms that would really kind of spoil the wine, spoil the grapes. Botrytis, remember, botrytis infection itself might not be considered bad. It might be considered a good thing, depending upon the condition and who's making the wine. Now, we're talking about this spoil, these spoiled grapes. What really happens? And are, are we talking about a health hazard, would you think? Or why wouldn't we want this? Or do we, are, is it that we don't want it or that we do want it? Does anybody know what the situation is? What a, does a winemaker take infected grapes or not? 
Yeah, I, that's the point. The, in California now, there's a voluntary setup where the winemaker does not accept grapes for winemaking if it's more than 15% by weight infected. Let's say non protritis infection. If, it has, if they're badly infected, so it's over 15% by weight, and then he doesn't take that. If, he can use it for distilling material, though. But if it's greater than 40%, he doesn't take it at all. Now, as I say, a voluntary setup, but with uh, the, um, the smile and the aid of the State Department of Agriculture, there are inspection people helping to, to enforce this. And it's, help, it's nice to have them there for the winemaker's point of view. He says, well, I don't want to take these. Then there's a little more uh, enforcement, I think, uh, of it, saying that he doesn't need to, or, or I shouldn't say that, but we, that they have an exact figure of how bad the spoilage is. But I'm back to the question, is this, do you can imagine this as a health hazard, or is it uh, a just uh, unpleasing and unesthetic? Well, anybody want to venture? It depends on the organisms that are infecting you. It's aspergillus flavus. Well, okay. Or, so We're going to, we have to talk, that's a good point. We have to talk about aspergillus flavus separately. How about for other organisms, would you think? Probably not. I think that there, it's just an aesthetic thing. And it's, uh, I don't think we want to drink wine that's made uh, out of spoiled grapes, but again, as Pasteur said, wine is the most healthy and hygienic of all beverages. Yes, Joe? You said if it's 50%, over 50% other than Well, the, the rule is this, if it's over 15% spoilage, the winemaker doesn't have to take it. Doesn't, but if it, if it happened to be a botrytis infection, and it was only botrytis, and it was a nice, you know, uh, like a, like a late, late harvested uh, sauterne wine, uh, grapes or, or uh, rind grapes, he'd take them. <laughs> you could know that. That's not, a, that's not a common thing in California. No, but you could tell by the kind of, if it, look, if it was just kind of nice dry berries rather than a bunch of slop. That's the point. What does happen when you get a, an infection? Either botrytis or botrytis plus something else. What happens is the grapes break open. It allows you to get, uh, start to get a fermentation. You're getting juicy grapes. You got juicy uh, juice, I should say, and you're getting, start to get into fermentation, either by uh, Saccharomyces that's either on the grapes or in the air, or by, some of these will carry out a small, uh, weak fermentation themselves. And so that's bad, because what, what can happen here, you start getting a little alcohol formed, you don't have the things that protect you. What, let's talk about that. What protects the winemaker from, from having problems with, with uh, molds during on a good, sound alcoholic fermentation. SO2, alcohol, anaerobic conditions, all these things. Well, out in the field, you don't have that. You don't have any SO2. You know, I mean, you possibly you have some from elemental sulfur. There's a theory that that goes to SO2, it's oxidized, but it's not important in this case. You have air pre present, and what was the other thing? Uh, and, and very little alcohol, have very little alcohol. So you, you're just ripe for acetic acid bacterial uh, spoilage, and other, other kinds of spoilage, other uh, organisms that, that wouldn't grow in wine themselves. So you, you have a, a putrid, I don't know, I think putrid has to, has to, is a term reserved for animal starting material, but you have a really bad, you can have a really rotten, rotten, that's a good word, a really rotten situation. Yeah. Are, uh, are there any photosynthetic organisms now? Oh, I haven't heard of any, but I don't know if anybody looked for them. That'd be kind of interesting, yeah. But I think under these conditions with, high, with glucose, photosynthetic organisms themselves would probably carry out glycolysis rather than the other direction, storing, storing it. Well, let's see. Let's see what, uh, talk about some of these organisms. Well, this one, of course, is famous. We already mentioned it, that in some situations that would be a prized uh, organisms to have, but it could be bad. And I don't know if you're aware, I think I've said this before, but while we like it and we think of it as a prized thing, if it, if it comes on, onto the vine before harvest, before maturity, it can be a really bad uh, organism. It can rot the stems and you can, I've seen it where it hasn't been well cared for and all of the bunches are on the ground about a week or two weeks before harvest and that's enough to break your heart. Does anybody know how to control botrytis? So historically what was used? <laughs> uh, Bordeaux. Spray was one of the things. Why is Bordeaux kind of bad to use? 
so much copper, and the copper gets in the soil and kills the vines. Besides, it's hard to make. Uh, you have to make it up fresh and all this. But what, do you know what's being used now? Yeah. Ben Late has just right. Ben Late has just been cleared for use on grapes. Registered is that the word for use on grapes in California or the United States? That's new. It's been used in Europe for quite a while. Oh. Ben Late or is Ben Miller Ben Late? Ben Late, I guess, is the American. It's a Dupont. Uh, fungicide. It also has another name, Benamil. It's a little bit expensive, but it's pretty effective. Okay, anybody know what these two are? Downy and powdery mildew. In that order? I don't know. Uh, yeah, yes. Right, you had it right. This is Downy. Plasmapara and oidium is uh, powdery. And which one do we have in California? We certainly do. And this one we don't have to worry about in California. Other places in the world do that. It's a lot of places have both of them. Just for just lucky once we don't have it. Um, because of conditions, not because it's not around. Um, how is it controlled best? All right, dusting sulfur. Um, and the, the theory is for best control is to do it early and often, every six inches of new shoot, so that by the time the grapes are ready to start to ripen, you don't you have good control, you don't have to use the sulfur anymore, and so we won't have it won't have an H2S. Okay. Yeah, do you know whether uh Benlight is any good for controlling downy mildew? Um I don't know. It's good for it'll control um powdery mildew. I I would guess yes, but I don't know. No. I don't know. Where's the Australians? Chris, what do you know? Yeah, you have it there. Yeah, okay. Okay, now somebody mentioned this. Why might this be a health hazard? New York papers don't... Okay, where was that? Do you know what that is? Uh, aflatoxin, I think it is. That's right, it's spelled right. A, yeah. It's a, it, this organism makes a potent carcinogen. Um, where was it first discovered, you know? Peanut what? Peanut. Peanuts, and if you find any fluorescent peanuts, <laughs> so if you're in a bar and you're eating peanuts, and this is a fluorescent <laughs> strongly, uh, beware. Now, one would wonder, say, well, the Aspergillus flavus isn't going to grow in wine, so there's no problem, right? But you could say, well, maybe that's not the case. Maybe it's on the grapes and made some aflatoxin. But I got good news. There's, now, this is a new paper. This just came out in... Um, Oh, that's that Zeitschrift for Lebensmittel und some type of Untersuchung, Forschung, uh, by Drawbert. And they looked at German wines, which is kind of good because if you expect it in any wines, you might expect it in late harvested grapes where you have, might have some damage done. And they checked in many, many wines and they didn't find it. And it's a good assay. It's a very sensitive assay for this. They, they concentrated the grape juice no, and pardon me, they concentrated the wine and then did two dimensional chromatograms and looked for the fluorescent spot at wherever that RF should be. And they didn't find any. And it's a very sensitive method. And if it were there, they would have found it. So it's good news. Yeah. Uh, we were just having a lecture on that in uh, 235, and two dimensional chromatograph doesn't do anything. The, the aflatoxin goes in the same speed in both directions, so you just get it in a straight. Diagonal line. It doesn't well, maybe it depends how you do it. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, that's something I hadn't thought about. I haven't, I haven't done it myself, but um, that's the way people have been doing it all the time. Yeah. Anybody, anybody else want to hear about this? Mm -hmm. I reserve comment on that. Yeah. Okay. No, I think there's several. Yeah, they're carcinogenic, but they're all for us. Yeah. I'll have to talk to Dennis Shee about that. See, oh well, we're on the list. We're on this. Uh, so these, there's some other molds that you should, that you should least have heard of. But uh, <laughs> we, these are these are ones that we came across when we were trying to do a study on infected grapes, and I'll explain why we're doing that in a minute. The Rhizobus uh, sclerotinia. This is the brown rot. One of them, at least. Altenaria. This is interesting. M mucor, do you know anything about it, especially? Yeah, and it will ferment. Carry out a weak fermentation. Make, make some uh, alcohol. 
Monelia is kind of interesting because it's not only important on the grapes, but it can be port important in the cellar too. If you've got raunchy cooperage or bad uh, cellar conditions, this can be one of your molds there. Penicillium, you know about it? Yeah. Anything special about this as far as winemaking you think of? It, it does give a flavor to... Yeah, and it can affect corks probably more than some of the other ones. And Professor Amrine says it feels that a corky character to wine can come from a cork infected with penicillin. Actinomyces, what, is, what, kind of, what kind of fungus is that? Do you know? Uh, slime mold. Hmm. It's, it's bacteria, yeah. It's a filamentous bacteria, and it, people get it confused with uh, fungi often. Um, it, ha it develops an earthy character. You know when you, um, I don't know how many of you are uh, rural enough to know that when you keep, try to keep the dust down, well, Davis is rural enough, I guess, try to keep the dust down by sprinkling sometimes in the evening, in the summer, you get this, dust, this earthy smell. That apparently is from Actinomyces. However, that is not the earthy character in wine when you get earthy wine. There's no connection. Uh, nobody's ever demonstrated any connection. People have tried to. This has been found in other, in other foods, but not that earthy character, but not in wine. Okay, I put a big line here because that's all, the, with all those we want to talk about on the grapes themselves. But I have here a Visoclamus. Do you know why I have that one listed? That's been a problem. Not in wine, but in what? Do you know? Strawberries. Strawberries? <laughs> no, in grape juice and other, and other fruit juices and in concentrate too. It's, it has been a, a bad problem in the sense that it's pretty, pretty heat resistant. That's not very nice. And it's not really ter terribly sensitive of SO2. Do you know how they solved the problem? This is the people at the Western Regional worked on this. Do you know how they solved the problem? Well, that's not bad, that's not bad but that tendalization really implies boiling, and they wouldn't want to boil the grape juice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Actually, uh, it's, it's so simple, you haven't... Uh, it's, it's, I said there is a sensitive to heat. It's insensitive, rather insensitive to heat, rather insensitive to SO2. They did put them together. Synergistic, e synergistic effect of the two together was the way they solved the problem, plus filtration. SO2 and heat together. I think that's a good take-home lesson, besides how to spell it. Okay. Rocodinium celera. Uh, celera. Uh, right here. Can you read that? Well, I'll leave it on the board after class. You can watch the tape. Uh, what is that? You know what that one is? That's that black mold in cellars. And when you go on tours, they say, see, we have the best cellars in the world because that purifies the air in the cellar. But does, does it, is there any, is, can you imagine any uh, rationale for saying that that mold is kind of good to have in a cellar? It's how it keeps others used look. Well, it, I think it indicates the coolness and the humidity in the cellar, but that's, I, what that has to do with wine, I'm not really sure. Well, I mentioned that we were interested in, in doing some work in infecting some of these berries, and the reason is this. We have this figure, which is very nice if you've got bunches of grapes coming in in gondolas, and the guy can take this bunch that's rotten and that bunch that's not rotten and weigh them and find out uh, what the percent is. But what if you've got mecha mechanically, har mechanically harvested berries? You've just got berries. And so you say, man, one for you and one for me. It's going through uh, 40 pounds of this little by little, and it's pretty, pretty hard for him to come up to any conclusion before the, before the day's through. So we wanted to see if there was any way we could do it quicker. And Mr. Traverso worked this out. By, you would have a sample, a random sample of the berries. Then if you could crush these, then take a random sample of that, put that in the wearing blender, take a random sample of that. Maybe if you looked under the microscope, you could count the, amount, the amounts of molds. There. Now this sounds like a wild thing, but it is done in, for, in other situations, something called the Howard Mold Count. Maybe you've had this. And it's used in tomatoes, um, tomato processing. And what it is is a, a slide, something like the Petrop Hauser, except it doesn't have any grids. The grid will be in the eyepiece itself. And it has a rather thick, uh, uh, rather thick uh, cover glass because we're going to be, we have a real thick suspension of stuff. It's not like uh, a wine or, or filtered grape juice. You've got all this particulate material in there. So you put that material on here, a small amount of the, on the slide, then put this down, and this shoulder on each side is raised a little bit higher than that, so you have an, a discrete chamber there. 
I put this down, and actually by the looking at the Fresnel, Fresnel rings here on each side, you know, the rainbows you can get when you have a thin space, you can, you can tell that that's just the height of chamber that you want. And then you can count certain fields. You have to have a microscope that is calibrated to give you a certain uh, field from the eyepiece, which is easily done. I mean, this can be out outfitted not too expensively. And this, this eyepiece is divided into six grids. And you look at a field, and you look for a mycelium, and if it's greater than one-sixth the diameter, in other words, if it, if it takes over one of those squares, then you count the field as positive. And you count 25 fields on this grid, on this uh, slide, and you get the percentage number of, of fields that are positive, and that gives you the Howard Mold count. Well, perhaps you look at a field? Okay, you look at a field, you look for mycelium, pieces of mycelium. And if you find a piece of mycelium, it takes a little trick to do that, to know the difference between mycelium and grape tissue, but it's easier in grapes than it is with tomatoes. You look for the mycelium, and if the mycelium is greater than one sixth of the diameter, of this field, which is easily estimated by, the, um, by this grid in here, then you count it as positive. More or less, that's the way it's done. And then you count the number of fields that are positive, and you get a percentage. And that percentage equals the Howard Mould count. And what does that tell us? That's just an empirical number. So we had to correlate that percent with actual percent weights done, Howard Mould count percent with the actual weights done um, done selected by selecting whole berries that have been infected or a certain percentage of sound berries and infected berries. And we got good, in the laboratory, we got good correlation between, let's say, percent of infection and Howard Mould count. Got a nice curve, something like this, and this is the area up to 15%. That was a nice straight line. Yeah. Well, it's empirical. I mean, I can do the actual number. I don't think it's very helpful. I don't think it really tells us. I can't remember offhand. I have the paper here. We can look at it afterwards. But this hasn't been checked in the field yet, so we don't know that, uh, that it is uh, going to be used, but it's something you should know about. And say that you have to do this. It'll be easy, f easy for you to learn how, but somebody you have to learn. <laughs> um, there is a, I'll just give a plug for the people that taught us, Stoner Lab in Santa Clara has a course for this in the summertime. And also the American Can Company has a course in this. They, it's ordinarily a week or two week course for most people. For you, believe me, you can do it in, in a half an hour, 15 minutes, honestly. Yeah. You're looking at grape juice? Grape juice. Yeah, let me tell you, again, I'll go through that. You take the random sample of 40 pounds is what they ordinarily use. It's a big, like a big stove pipe that goes down into the gondola and picks up this 40 pounds. Then this is crushed. Regularly, they have a small hand crusher there and then mixed up so you have a good mixture there. Then a small amount of that is taken, put in a wearing blender, blended, and so you put in a small sample of that goes onto the plate. So hopefully you're getting a random thing. That's what has to be checked, whether that, whether this Howard Mould count will really correlate with this figure in the field. And that hasn't been done yet. I want to make that quite clear. And, and the other thing is, what if it's botrytis? You may want to, you may want to let them pass. Well, Mr. Traverso again found that he could identify botrytis pretty well, especially if it had gotten a good start, which it would have had uh, over anything else. There's certain spores, non-sexual spores, that are pretty unique for botrytis. No, no, the point is, hmm, well, I, I didn't tell it quite true. You could have, if you have three pieces of mycelium that are, Together, you can approximate that you can estimate they're bigger than one sixth. You have to, you just have to have some some empirical means. You you've got to have some length. See the mycelium. It's not like uh, mic microbes like yeast growing where you have a bunch of individual cells. You just have this big uh, mycelial mass, and it gets chopped up. Uh, I was going to say the difficult. It's difficult to tell the difference between this, this and and vegetable fibers. That's the hardest part. That's what you really have to go to the class for. But there's certain, there's certain ways, that there's certain distinctive characteristics of mycelium. But it's easier, fortunately, it turns out to be easier to distinguish this from grape material than it does from tomato, tomato, tomato material. Okay. Any questions on that? We'll go, oh, God, I forgot one thing. Please don't let me. Um, this is 
Oh, it's, these are student evaluations, and yeah. <laughs> don't fill them out now. Go go to the graduate tonight and fill them out. <laughs> no, um, give them when you fill them out after class because we still got lecture. But give them to um, give them to Mrs. Hendricks. These are these are the College of Agriculture's um, uh, student viewpoint um, conk, conked out on us this year for some reason or other. But listen, please, please uh, turn one in. Even a blank is better than nothing at all. Or a bad one is better than nothing at all because it's just like we weren't even here. here. But, but put those uh, someplace else now while we try to get through 10 lectures that we're behind. Now, I wanted to talk a little bit about filters because I thought maybe we didn't have enough information on that. I'm going to leave that up there for you to people over here that haven't had a chance to, to learn how to spell those. Um, no. You sure? Oh, God. <laughs> Sure. Yes. Is it? Yes. I swear to you. Well, that doesn't help, but maybe it's maybe you're right. Well, we'll see. <laughs> Don't anybody leave this room. Um, well, for the purposes of this class, it's just been respelled. Oh, that's a diphthong out of Latin going into Greece, that, Greek. That's why that's that way. Yeah, um, there, yeah there's there's. <laughs> There's two kinds of filters, and we, we should discuss them both a little bit, some of the advantages and disadvantages of both. And I think, really, we need, we need them both, or are using them both in California. One is the depth type, which would be the familiar asbestos or the new cellulose or, or uh, glass ones. And then the other would be the membrane, which is sometimes called the sieve. S sieve type. And the main difference to these is that this membrane sieve type has discrete holes in it that are smaller than what you're trying to get out. And so the, the organism will sit on top. It will be sieved out of the thing. And you say, well, naturally, that's the, way you, that's the way you're going to filter anything out. But in fact, that's not true with the depth filter. The holes are much, much bigger than the organism itself. And how does it work? Well, you have a, say, it, it's deep. That's why it's called depth. You have a long path, maybe, like this, and the organism has to go through that torturous path, is a phrase you always say, and it's so long that eventually it gets caught up someplace here and gets hit on the side and doesn't get through. So what does this mean? First of all, it means this is going to clog very readily, isn't it? Because once these, all these holes are filled up, it, you're through. But here, this isn't going to clog readily because you have lots of space left. What about if you wanted to say you were going to absolutely take out all the cells? Could you apply that to this, all the cells of a certain size? Could you say it's an absolute filter? Yeah? Oh, come for the way ahead of it. I'll put it in, I'll put it in quotation marks. It is absolute because any organism that's bigger than that hole, if it's working properly, will not go through. So this will be called a relative type. But is, what does that really mean in real life? What it means is you could make any specifications you want on this. Let's say that you're going to say it'll take out 99.999% of the yeast. But say that that's not quite good enough. You wanted two more nines on there. What would you do? And you wanted that. Yeah, you put a little more on the bottom here, a deeper filter. So this term relative and absolute is not, somebody said, is this is kind of absolutely relative and this is kind of relatively absolute. And it's interesting, there was a court case recently in Germany. Um, Zeitz sued Millipore because Millipore had come through with their American style advertising, says, see, these depth filters, they're not absolute filters, they're only relative filters, and we can guarantee you absolute filters. And it turned out, first of all, they weren't used to that kind of advertising. And second of all, it was somewhat misleading. And the case was settled out of court, and everybody's happy and all that. But the point is that while this is relative, 
you could you can make it as rel you you can make it as relative as you want. You can make it as absolute as you want. I guess is the way to put it. Well, what else uh, can we? We've already talked about another advantage of the membrane filter. What was that? Hmm? Not always. Some of them, some of the newer ones can be back flushed. Some can. What else? Remember the bubble test? I think that's an important part. You can you can put the you can apply a bubble test to a sieve type, but you can't apply a bubble test to the depth type. Yeah, that's very good. You can theoretically you can get grow through, grow through, growth through. That if you were using this for several days and you stopped every once in a while, let's say you had an organism got this far and you didn't sterilize this the next day, this organism starts to grow. Eventually, he's going to be out here and into your field. No. No, I don't think... Well, I mean, aren't, aren't the buds, the yeast form, smaller than the yeast themselves? Yeah, but they're still... Oh, you mean if the bud would come off? Yeah. Hmm. I know of... Okay, I've never heard of it actually happening, though. But it's possible. <laughs> yeah. But still, you're, you're still using pretty small. Now, think about for Saccharomyces cerevisiae. We're using something that is, say, 10 microns long, 5 microns wide, and you're using a pore 1.2. That may solve the problem. Hmm? Well, you can even use, but this takes out the yeast, too. I'm doing on time. Okay. What's another problem? With um, the depth filter that you can have. Disposal. What you gonna do with it, Jane? What, what are you gonna do with all your diatomaceous Yeah, that's, that, that's I don't have that down. That's good. <laughs> yeah. What? Migration. Channeling. Yeah. Channeling. Is that what you mean? No, I didn't hear what John says. But channeling, you don't get channeling here, but you do get. You can get channeling here with um, uh, surges on uh, the. Pressure, etc. Oh, there'll be uh, say that you have this backed up with uh, diatomaceous earth. Let's put it this way: way, way we'd ordinarily see it in a plate and frame. Then this would be you would have run your first materials through with diatomaceous earth, let's say, or some sort of filter aid, and so you would have coated the front of the of the uh, filter like that. Only be it would actually be more down here than at the top. Now. This is a pre-filter, another depth filter for this filter to keep this one from clogging up. And what you can get is with a surge of pressure, you can break holes into here. And actually, you can do it with a filter sometimes, too. If it's, a, if it's an old filter and it's been used a lot and you have heavy pressures and you're getting the um, weak, weakened uh, filter, you can break through some holes there so that the, the organisms will go through, or everything will go through. Yeah. I think so, but cellulose isn't, nobody's ever said cellulose is carcinogenic. So, you can get those crazy hairballs of eat persimmons, too. <laughs> no, uh, I don't, I mean, what difference does it make? Uh, <laughs> Is it, is it, no, is that, can, can you imagine cellulose fibers and uh, tiny cellulose fibers in wine would be a health hazard? Make you sneeze? <laughs> Make you sneeze. <laughs> okay. Well, okay. Which one of these can be... Oh, oh, oh. Okay. Very good. Got out of that. Well, that brings me to another point. What do you need? What do you really need? You need both, don't you? Now, in Europe, they're not using the membrane filters very much. They may be using them more and more now. Most of those companies are going into membrane filtration, too. Because the ideal situation is to do both, is to have a good, polished filtration with a depth filter of some sort, and then use your membrane filtration as the, quote, absolute. Um, which can be sterilized? Both, that's right. By running steam through them or uh, hot water. Steri uh, yeah. To sterilize them? No. That's. Oh, no. I would, there, there are certain cleaning agents that you can use and probably should use. Um, I'm not exactly sure if you should use them on these or not, these chlorines or iodoforms. But these are cleaning agents. These, um, 
will clean surfaces and they're good for using on hoses and tanks, but don't ever be misled to think that that will sterilize because you've got all sorts of nooks and crannies. The only way you can get to that is by heat. That's, a, that's one thing you, I hope you learned. Yeah, yeah Mark. Oh, how much heat can the membrane take? The, um, some of it depends. There's silver ones, actually, that uh, take a lot of heat. But the, the um, milliport type, the cellulose acetate ones, you can autoclave them for a minimum time. Um, for, in other words, one atmosphere pressure for 15 minutes, and it doesn't hurt them. But I even noticed when we were doing that experiment upstairs, we're boiling them, the ones in the evening were, had been boiled all day. They weren't nearly as uh, turgid as the ones in the early afternoon. So I wouldn't boil them for more than a couple hours, eight hours, yeah. <laughs> well, let's see. What, um, any questions on that? We've still got yeah. five minutes in the six subjects. When I hear everybody saying rough filtrations yeah. and, and polished filtrations. What's, I, I realize that there's a big difference, but how do you set up, what is the difference in setting up between a rough filtration? It's, rel it's relative. No, it can be the, the, the pore size or the channel size of the, of the uh, filter itself. And they are quite a bit different because when, it's, if, when you're first doing a rough filtration, say you've got a lot of yeast in there, you don't, you're not trying to get it brilliant and you just plug, you could plug this up so quick you'd have to be spending most of your time changing them. Yeah. Um, for most general filtration work, which is better, constant pressure or constant volume? I think you want as constant pressure as you possibly can. I, the, no, the volume is going to, that's what you do. You measure, just like the cylinder index, you measure to see when the, vol, when the flow rate is maybe half of what it was or uh, a third of what it was. So the flow rate is not going to stay the same by any means. Keep the yeah, keep the pressure. That generally gets the best sort of filtration. Right, I think so. Yeah. Well, uh, two minutes, one on the deacidification of the malolactic experiment that we did. Mrs. DeCasper ran TAs for us and the malic acid. Um, concentration. So I'll put those down. The malic acid concentration, malic acid termination was done on the, the uh, fermenting must that we took a sample of at the time we inoculated. Um, and that turned out to be 0.0378% malic acid. Now the T, the titratable acidity of the pasteurized wine, or the wine that had come from pasteurized must. This one had not gone undergone malactic fermentation. And that had 0.78% TA. Now the, the unpasteurized, which had gone, plus malolactic, not plus malic acid, plus malolactic fermentation, it had 0.063%. Now let's just see how close we came to what we theoretically should have. What should, yeah? Is that 0.63 or 0.063? You just said 0.63. Point 0.63. So if this is 0.378, how much should we have lost from malolactic fermentation? Half of it. So that half would have, in other words, it would be one, six, nine. But this is malic acid. These are measured as tartaric acid. So we have to put in the molecular factor there. And from the old enology handbook, I don't think it's in the new one, unfortunately. If you convert malic acid to tartaric acid for titratable acidity, you multiply times 1.2. Is that clear? In other words, we're going from uh, presenting it as malic acid, we're going to present it as tartaric acid so we can compare it with what we actually got. So theoretically, if I did my calculations right, you check me, we should have lost 0.212% TA expressed as tartaric acid. Well, before we actually subtract these two, we can use a little fudge factor here. When you autoclave, you lose about 10% of your volume. You pasteurize, you may think you lose about half, uh, half of that, maybe 5%. So we've lost some volume. So this um, acidity really should be a little bit higher. Let's say it's 5% higher. Was really the acidity that we'd had in the, in the wine before pasteurization. Let's just say it really should have been 0.81%. Well, why higher? 
if you lose, if you're losing volume, then the pasteurized wine should be more acidic than the unpasteurized wine. Right. You're right. Let's forget that fudge factor. I was, doing, I was doing that over a bad tuna sandwich. Well, it comes out worse then. Okay. As we say, we pasteurize, you very seldom lose any volume. So we can go ahead. Science. Yeah. Okay, quick, because your calculator, what is this? So I didn't do it that way. So subtract. Okay, and... This is what we should have gotten. So what does that mean? <laughs> well, what legitimately, well, legitimately, where could this extra acid have come from? No, they had the yeast in both cases. That's one thing it could, probably didn't come from, was the yeast. From something to lactic acid. That the bacteria made some lactic acid in this case that they didn't make in this case. The other thing, it, it, I've never worked with pasteurized must before in this case, and that we don't really know what happens there. But um, I did, we're not going to talk about the um, method for two minutes. Yeah, I know you don't have class, so just two minutes. Um, the method for the, anything from now on you're not held for. But the method for uh, enzymatic analysis for malic acid or lactic acid, I have a handout for that. And I think it's self-explanatory. It's designed for malic acid, but there are some notes. I would give uh, Rick for your passes over back there. There's some notes on. I'll wait till we all have that. Then the only other thing I want to spend one spend one minute on floor sherry, submerged floor sherry. Then that's it. Do you give one to Leslie behind you and then pass the other down here? Oh, well. Waiting for that, I was going to, yeah, need some more? Okay. Waiting for that. One of the subjects we didn't talk about and won't have a chance to talk about is the enological literature, microbiological literature, and I think you're pretty well familiar with that anyway. It's in our library, most of it. There is one thing you might not know is that last spring, about a year ago, the American Chemical Society had a symposium on wine chemistry, and this volume, plus, which will be full of the, the symposium lectures plus other uh, invited uh, lectures, well, should be out in the next six months or sometime. And um, here, <laughs> uh, and I think it's I I think it'll be uh, important for you to look at that. One thing I would say that the um, malolactic uh, situation is going to be very well represented there. We have there'll be two or three new chapters on malolactic fermentation in that. Okay, oh, give, give me one of those, huh? <laughs> I just want to point out two things. This is designed for use with the Zeitz or the DU, or the small cuvette of three milliliters. If you want to use it for the Bectronic, uh, BNL Spectronic 20, which requires at least four milliliters, you have to adjust the volume. And I've suggested there you double for the mounts for the Spectronic 20. And then here, the side here, this explained about if you're going to use for lactic acid. This is for malic acid. For lactic acid, you have to use lactic dehydrogenases, of course, and the one that's hard to find, the address is given in one of your other handouts. Uh, and you'd use your standard curve, you'd use your L or D lactic acid. The activity, the amount of enzyme you might use might not be exactly the same because the activities aren't the same, but you'd work that out with your standard curve. Any quick question on that? Okay, one minute about floor sherry. If you say that you're going to start a submerged culture of floor sherry, um, what what would your starting material be? Your sharing material. What would you ideally? What would you want? Yeah. Okay, fifteen point five. Why would you? Why would you want fifteen point five? Who took my chalk? Yes, bro. Okay, fine. Okay. Oh. Oh. But I think we can do all right. I think Mr. O says 14.5 to 15.5%. Trouble when you're getting too high, it's going to take too long for the yeast to acclimatize. But this is going to keep your acetobacter down. What about SO2? What do you want in there? It doesn't really matter. Does it? Yeah. Um, from practical experience, yes, it does. If you've got over 300 parts per million SO2, then it won't go. Oh, thank you. Let's say less than 300 parts per million SO2. Okay, how much sugar do we want in there? 
None. Yes, it does make a difference because the, the flour process won't start as long as the sugar there. So we want it dry. And then we're going to add our culture. What would be a good starting culture size, would you think? Yeast, final yeast pump. Well, if you're using, what are you using as your starting material? Um, uh, Shermont? It's not, no, then I would say higher, 10%. What you'd like to do is start with 10 to the 6 cells per milliliter, about. And see, it's only going to go to about 10 to the 7 cells. It's not like a grape juice fermentation. So this is a start. And you could use a starting material by just taking grape juice and fermenting and adding it to this. And nothing's going to happen until you be adding some sugar, too, because, as you say, you haven't finished the fermentation. So nothing's going to happen until it gets dry. Or you could try to start it in a, in a well, you couldn't start it in, a, in, in wine itself because you have to have the extra pressure. That's the next point. So the starter, I think your starter, the starter would be 10% uh, grape juice starter. And then have to wait till it gets dry. And then what about pressure do we want? What pressure do we want? Did you know we want pressure? We're talking about submerged floor sherry. Submerged floor sherry. One atmosphere. Stirred occasionally, say once an hour. Uh, just a small stirring, once time, one time per hour. Now, you're going to monitor this. What's the best way to monitor to see if everything's going all right? That's one way, but maybe better, because you, it's going to take a while for it to build up. What's going to be more sensitive, perhaps? No. <laughs> up here, do a cell count with your, with your uh, Levy Hauser. And look for this, and the highest it will go is 10 to the 7th. And that's going to be your that's going to be your steady state situation. And when it's there, then it's really going good, and you can get up to, say, 700 parts per million acetaldehyde, or maybe higher. So I think that, see, uh, oh, then what else do you need? Most important of all. Hmm? Time. Yeah, right, you need time, because it's our patience. It takes a long time for the cells to adapt. Once they've adapted, then you can do kind of a semi-continuous situation. You can take out half of the sharing material and put in new, new sharing material. But until that gets going, you can be very discouraged. This is going to stay around 10 to the 6 for a long time and maybe even drop a little bit before it gets going again. Any question on that? Then we can go. The cells? That's the same thing. I mean, it's, they're dying. Oh, I see. Um, oh, uh, it wouldn't get very far down. It would, you, you might, if you lost more than half, you're in trouble. You'd start with another starter. Okay, we'll see you at the final or maybe at the graduate tonight. <laughs> I don't really understand, but it's got to be dry. Ah, thank you.